One sample t-test is chapter 9. Chapter 10 is independent samples t-test. And then chapter 11 is dependent samples t-test. So the t-statistic, it allows you to use sample data instead of, because most of the time we don't have population data, and test hypotheses about an unknown population mean. The advantage is you don't have, you don't need any knowledge of the population standard deviation. And um, the t-statistic can be used to test hypotheses about a completely unknown population. Both mu and sigma are unknown, and the only available information about the population is from the sample. Um, so what we need to test a hypothesis with the t-test is a reasonable hypothesis about the population mean. Um, there are two general situations where this type of hypothesis is used when um, a researcher wants to determine whether or not a treatment causes a change in a population mean, um, which the, you know, one, one of the situations, the error between the sample mean and the population mean is simply due to sampling error, and there was no treatment effect. Or there is a treatment effect, and we want to know is that difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean more than what would we would see by chance. So is it more than just sampling error? Is there an actual difference? So um, whenever a sample is obtained from a population, you expect to find some error between your sample mean and the population mean, and that's known as sampling error. And the general goal of hypothesis testing is to evaluate whether um, the difference between these two is a true difference because of whatever the treatment was, or is it just due to sampling error? So the characteristics of the T distribution, it's like the Z. They're both continuous distributions. It's bell-shaped and it's symmetrical. Um, however, there isn't just one T distribution. It's a family of distributions. So they all have a mean of zero, but their standard deviations differ according to the sample size. So as you can see from the picture, as the T, um, the T distribution is more sp spread out and flatter at the center than the standard normal, the Z distribution. Um, but as sample size increases, it becomes the same as the Z. So um, this usually happens when you have becoming normal, matching the Z, when you have over 30, a sample size of over 30. Um, then, so because they don't match at small sample sizes, you're going to have different critical values. same, but it's a different value. When you get over 200 samples, or a sample size of over 200, that's like on the infinity line on the back of the t-table, the numbers match what you would find on your z-table. So, Records on a fleet of trucks reveal that the average life of a set of spark plugs is normally distri distributed with a mean of 22,100 miles. The fleet owner purchased 18 sets and found that the sample average life was 23,400 miles. The sample standard deviation was 1,412 miles. To determine if the spark plugs average 22,100 22, miles, um, what if it's different than that, what's the critical value for the test using a 0.05 alpha level? So here you would just look up, you first need to figure out your degrees of freedom, which you have a sample size of 18, so your degrees of freedom here would just be n minus 1, so 17, and you look on your table 
for degrees of freedom at 17, and then you go over to the column that has two-tailed test at 0.05. And you should see this value, 2.110. So the estimated standard error and the t-statistic. The t-statistic requires that you use sample data to compute the estimated standard error versus the z where we would just use the population standard deviation and divide that by the square root of the sample size. Here, instead of the population standard deviation, you're going to use your um, sample standard deviation. And... The estimated standard error, you could use either one of these formulas to calculate it. Um, the t statistic, like the z score, forms a ratio. The top ratio contains the obtained difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean. There are always going to be some kind of difference in the numer numerator, always, in all of these formulas. The bottom is the um, standard error, which measures how much difference is expected by chance. Um, so this is the standard error. You would just plug in either one of those in the bottom. So you can think of the t-statistic as an estimated z-score, right? The estimation comes from the fact that we're using sample variance to estimate the unknown population variance. With large, a with large sample, the estimation is very good, and the t-statistic will be very similar to a z-score. With small samples, it, it's not very good. It's a poor estimate of z. Um, the value of the degrees of freedom, df, is always n minus 1 with the one sample t-test. And it will determine how well the distribution of t approximates a normal distribution. For large values, the t-distribution will be nearly normal, but with very small values, it will be flatter and more spread out than a normal distribution. So hypothesis test with the T statistic, it follows the same four procedures as with z-score tests. You state the null hypothesis and select a value for alpha, or you're told a value for alpha. And um, the null hypothesis always states a specific value for the population mean. Um, locate the critical region, which this is where your table comes in. You have to calculate your degrees of freedom, and based on those degrees of freedom, you'll find your critical values for whatever you, you're told alpha is or whatever you set alpha at. Um, then you calculate the actual T statistic, the test statistic, and make a decision. If your test statistic falls within the critical region, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. If it falls not in the critical region, so in the main body of the distribution, you're going to fail to reject your null hypothesis. So... Chapter 10 is independent samples. Independent measures, hypothesis tests, allow research to evaluate the mean difference between two populations using the data from two separate samples. So the identify, identifying characteristic of independent measures or between subjects design is the existence of two separate or independent samples. So you'll be told sample one has a mean of this, and sample 2 has a mean of this, and the sample size for both. So an independent measures design can be used to test for mean differences between two distinct populations, such as men versus women, or treatment conditions, control versus an actual experimental condition. 
So you have population A taught by method A. You don't know the population mean, um, but you take a sample from it and you can calculate the sample mean. And then you have population B that's taught by method B and you get a sample mean for method B. The independent measures design is used in situations where a researcher has no prior knowledge about either of the two population or treatments being compared. The population means and standard deviations are unknown. The general purpose is to determine whether the sample mean difference obtained in a research study indicates a real mean difference between the two populations or treatments, or whether the obtained difference is simply the result of sampling error. So this difference between a sample mean and the true population mean is sampling error. And the hypothesis test provides a standardized formal procedure for determining whether the mean difference obtained in a research study is significantly greater than what could be explained by chance or sampling error. So the first step, you need to compute the sample mean and the sum of squares for both samples, or you'll be told the sum of squares, or the standard deviation, or the variance. So you need to be able to go between all of these three. Right? So if you're given the um, sample standard deviation, you would square it to get the variance, and then you would multiply it by your sample size minus one to get your sum of squares. So then you want to, well, you want to state the hypotheses and select an alpha level. Um, HO states that there is no difference between the two populations. So it would look like M1 equals M2 so the mean from sample one equals the mean from sample two. Um, or it could be written as the mean of sample one minus the mean of sample two equals zero. Those two mean the same thing. Then you want to figure out your degrees of freedom and locate the critical region, find your critical values. Um, So your degrees of freedom for independent samples are your sample size for sample one plus your sample size for sample two minus two. And then you want to compute the test statistic, which has the same structure as the single sample t-test. However, in the independent measures, all components of the t-formula are doubled. So there's two sample means, two population means, and two sources of error contributing to the standard error in the denominator. And then finally make a decision whether it is, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, your calculated T statistic did not fall into the critical regions, or reject the null hypothesis, your calculated T statistic is in the tails and meaning it's significant that this difference between your sample means isn't due to chance or sampling error. Um, so the top line gives you all the stuff for the single sample or one sample t-test and the bottom is the independent measures t-test. So for a one sample t-test you would have the mean, the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the estimated standard error. Right? For the independent measures your numerator is going to be 
your sample mean from sample one minus your sample mean from sample two divided by your estimated standard error. So this is there in that formula, your mean, your population means for sample one and sample two. However, we don't know them, so they're always zero. And then dependent sample t-test, it's also called related measures, um, or paired t-test. And related samples, it allows you to evaluate the mean difference between two treatment conditions using the data from a single sample. So the same sample of people are measured twice. And um, a single group of individuals is obtained, and each individual is measured in both the treatment conditions being compared. So um, you could have like a baseline measure and then give them a treatment and measure them after the treatment to see if they've changed from the beginning. Uh, but the thing is here is that you have only one sample, but that one sample is measured twice. So the data consists of two scores for each individual. And in this situation, it's possible to compute a different score for each individual. So you're going to have a D or a different score. So you would have X1 would be the first measurement. X2 is the second measurement. You subtract F X1 from X2 so that you don't get negative numbers. And um, then whatever that difference is, you would have one different score for each person. So sample of different scores is used to test the hypothesis about the population of different scores. The null hypothesis states that the population of different scores has a mean of zero. Um, basically, mu sub d equals zero. And then for the alternative hypothesis, it's always going to be mu sub d does not equal zero. So in English, that means um, there's no difference between the to treatment conditions or between the before and after had no effect. So A would be no difference. B would be obviously there is difference. It's not zero. It's less than zero. And so D is your different scores, and all that was done was they for subject A, they took 14, subtract 10 from it, that gives you 4. And the same thing all for B, C, and D. And then you would average those to get the average difference. You just want to make real sure that when you are adding them that... Um, you keep in mind the negative numbers. So 4 plus negative 2 is 2 plus 3 is 5. So your average, the sum of all these different scores is going to be 6 divided by 4. And that would give you your average difference, your D bar. So the alternative hypothesis states that there is a difference between treatments, that it doesn't equal zero. And um, sample mean difference obtained in the research study is a reflection of the true mean difference that exists in the population. So we're always going to have on top some kind of difference score. And on bottom, we will always have the standard error. So. Here, the mean difference minus mu d, mu d is always zero. 
you get that out of your null hypothesis. So you're just going to have your mean difference on top divided by your standard error. And here, to calculate your DEF, your degrees of freedom, N is not going to be how many times everybody was measured. It is the number of people that were measured or the number of pairs. So in this example, we had four subjects. So N would be four, not eight. That makes sense. So our DF would be 3. And the standard error is computed the same way. So you would take these, the mean difference, right, and subtract each individual subject's difference score from well, subtract the mean difference from each individual's difference score. So it would be 4 minus the mean difference. Two, negative 2 minus the mean difference. And then you would square that to get the differences squared, the deviation squared, and sum all of those to get the sum of squared deviated difference scores and divide it by n minus 1 and take the square root and that will give you your standard deviation of difference scores. So the primary advantage of repeated measures is that it reduces variance and error by removing individual differences. If you took one sample of people and and gave them some kind of treatment, and then took another sample of people and gave them some kind of treatment, you're going to have error or noise that has to do with each individual in each one of these samples, individual characteristics. So when you sample just one group of people and, test and measure them twice, you're eliminating all of that noise. So you're going to have a more powerful test. So, the difference scores for each subject provides an indication of how much difference there is between the two treatments, or between the before and the after. If all the subjects show roughly the same difference scores, then you can conclude that there appears to be a consistent systematic difference between the two treatments. You should also note that when all the different scores are similar, the variance of the different scores will be small, which means that the standard error will be small and the t-statistic is more likely to be significant. You should also note that the process of subtracting to obtain different scores removes the individual differences from the data. The initial differences in performance from one subject to another are eliminated. Removing individual differences also tends to reduce the variance, which creates a smaller standard error and increases the likelihood of a significant T statistic. So here we've got different scores that vary from 3 to 7. And that didn't. And all the subjects shown increase roughly five points when they move from treatment one to treatment two. Because the treatment difference is very consistent, the different scores are all clustered close together. And they're going to produce a small value for the variance. This means that the standard error in the bottom of the T statistic will also be small. Um, the original data show big differences from one subject to another. So, Subject A goes from 9 to 16 between X1 and X2, but subject B is in the 20s, and subject C is in the 30s. Um, so if these were in eight people, your variance would be a lot larger.
So because you're comparing the same people, you're taking away the differences, the individual differences. Um, they're less variable, and you'll get a smaller variance in standard error. There are potential disadvantages to using a repeated measures design instead of independent measures. Because the repeated measures requires that each individual participate in more than one treatment, there's always a risk that exposure to the first treatment will cause a change in the participants that influences their scores in the second treatment. Usually it has to do with memory. If you give somebody a pretest and then you give them exam one, say, and they remember something about the pretest, they'll do better on exam one than if they hadn't. And an easy way to get around that is just make sure that you have enough time in between the pretest and the first test so that they forget. Um, so practice on the first treatment may cause an improved performance in the second. The scores in the second treatment may show a difference, but the difference is not caused by the treatment. Um, it's caused by order effects or memory. And so definitely know how to calculate all of these things. And one sample t-test, an independent measures t-test, and a dependent measures t-test. 